I'm Sean Murphy, and I'm very pleased to be the moderator for this panel of very honored guests, um, Hussein Imanji, uh, Richard Rudick, um, Jenny Barnett, John Gallagher, and uh, Howard Weiner. And um, I'm going to give you all maybe a couple of minutes to just uh, talk about yourselves and, 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 and set us up for our panel on uh, the use of big data and how we can really ascribe to um, all those areas that we've been talking about and enhance it with many of the new rubrics of um, big data and using big data in healthcare and understanding our, our diseases better with that. Hussein? Thank you. Um, Hussein Imanji, I head up neuroscience R&D at Janssen, which is part of Johnson & Johnson. Um, I'm excited to be here because while I strongly, strongly believe that we're going to make headway primarily by focusing on biology, biology, biology. I think it's also a very exciting time where we can marry the biology with technology and big data. And in some ways, and this may be wishful thinking, you know, one of the challenges we've had in making progress in our understanding and treatment of brain disease and disorders is a relative inaccessibility of the brain. But I think if you think about it, you know, cognition, emotion, <coughs> behavior, those are really very amenable to being picked up through digital technologies, especially through remote sensing, et cetera. So I strongly believe that by marrying the biology with some of the technological and big data advances, we can really make a difference, not only in you know, the neurodegenerative diseases and disorders you've heard a lot about, but also the serious psychiatric illnesses, which by and large are the chronic diseases of the young. Thanks. Richard. I'm Rick Rudick. I'm a neurologist uh, with Biogen. Uh, I spent most of my career in academic neurology at the Cleveland Clinic, starting uh, working on MS before there were disease-modifying therapies and watching happily as we developed multiple therapies. Uh, I went to Biogen because of the opportunity to start working on methods to move toward individualized or personalized use of the MS therapies based on science and evidence. And uh, we, 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 we don't know how to do that yet in MS, so we don't have personalized neurotherapeutics in MS. I'm really happy with the panel because we're looking forward now to other diseases which will become, uh, so they'll, be, they'll become manageable diseases as well, and we're gonna, need, uh, we're gonna need approaches to individualized and personalized neurotherapeutics. I think big data and technology will be central. Jenny? Thank you. I'm Jenny Barnett. I'm Chief Scientist at Cambridge Cognition. Uh, I think I'm here representing what small innovative technology companies um, can do in this space. So Cambridge Cognition takes um, digital biomarkers as they come out of research and makes them um, usable and scalable for clinical trials and healthcare. So for about 15 years, we've been doing this with uh, cognitive tests um, as endpoints for clinical trials. Um, more recently, uh, taking the same science, making it available um, so that we can uh, um, pre-screen patients for clinical and cognitive um, phenotypes uh, in their home before bringing them into uh, Alzheimer's uh, recruitment sites. Um, and most recently, we've been working on uh, consumer-grade technologies, so mobile phones, wearables such as the Apple um, Watch. Uh, what we're trying to do here is take... Um, uh, scientifically valid but very abbreviated forms of cognitive tests, um, PROs, and the other things that these technologies can, can measure, so physiological measures such as heart rate, um, and combine those in a way that's usable for a patient so that instead of collecting these data months apart, we can collect data um, on an hour-by-hour hour or day-by-day day basis. And we think that collecting this, this very rich um, data set can help in clinical practice by giving patients and doctors a shared data set on which to discuss how a patient's doing, whether a drug's helping, whether a dose needs to be increased or decreased, um, and in clinical trials and drug development by giving us um, a, a much better picture or, um, of the um, effect of a drug on, on patients, differences between patients, um, giving us an earlier readout. Excellent. John. So, uh, my name is John Gallagher. I'm an epidemiologist. Um, I'm also director of the MRC uh, Dementia Platform UK, which is a public-private partnership. The Dementia's Platform takes the, if you like, the background science infrastructure of the UK, uh, and it uh, focuses it on uh, <coughs> dementia research. 
uh, our, we have three main utilities. The, the first is uh, rapid data access, where we bring uh, scientists to the data. Uh, we are in the process of uh, collating data from 34 cohorts involving uh, 2 million people, uh, followed between uh, 10 and 60 years. Uh, so that's, uh, that's one of our uh, uh, functionalities. Another is to develop the uh, technology capacity of the UK. So we have three uh, technology networks. We have a molecular and structural imaging network, we have a stem cell network, and we have a bioinformatics network. And uh, these, uh, these, these uh, uh, utilities are there to recruit uh, for uh, early disease stage or preclinical uh, clinical trials. We're discovering this is a really big challenge but nevertheless, that's what we in, intend to be doing. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we really do look forward to increasing the capacity within the UK, but actually it's a capacity for everyone, and we'd be delighted to uh, work with you. <coughs> Howard. Uh, I'm Howard Weiner, I'm a neurologist. I'm at the Brigham and Women's Hospital uh, in Boston. I founded in uh, direct the Partners MS Center, uh, which uh, has followed patients for the last few decades with the disease. I also co-direct the Ann Romney Center for Neurologic Disease, just established with Dennis Selko, where we're studying multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, uh, ALS, and brain tumors. In terms of big data, I've been fortunate, as Rick has, in my lifetime to see treatments for MS uh, being developed. And this raises very big questions. What do we do when we have a series of treatments? Which treatments do we use? And the other question is, what have we learned in MS that can be applied to other diseases? I think we have one of the most exciting programs in big data going on in collaboration with Biogen, and probably the biggest big data group in the world, Google, who have uh, Verily, a company they started. And in our uh, study of the patients we have at the Brigham, we are collecting literally terabytes of data on each patient where we integrate uh, studies of blood, uh, serum, stool, urine, saliva, uh, and MRI to try and understand the individual patients uh, in addition to uh, connecting them to devices. So it's a very exciting time. Thank you, Howard. So I can't help but uh, be impressed with the uh, earlier panels that we had here. And one of the things I thought was made particularly clear, clearly clear was that much of what happens in many of the dementing and, and degenerative diseases is precedented by up to 30 years of a prodrome where we don't really ever currently, with our, with our current optics, uh, have the ability to um, know that that is brewing the whole time. And then I was impressed by the fact that PET scanners might be an interesting solution, but for 47 million patients, that's not really gonna work. But we do, most people in this room have a handheld or an iPhone or, a, or an Android that might enable us to do some big data analysis. And so, Jenny, for example, I know that you're involved with <coughs> some of that kind of work. Yeah, that's right. I think one of the things that, so, so we work in products that range from medical devices where you um, assess patients on a one-off visit and you're trying to make a probabilistic um, judgment on the basis of that. I think what the ubiquitousness of these devices offer is an opportunity to be um, monitoring people over time. And we know that if I assess you once, I can say something about your risk for disease. If I know how you're changing over time, I can say something a lot more specific about your, your risk for disease. So I think the one of the opportunities um, for big data in this area is simply to have a better understanding of risk, a better understanding of people's baseline before they come into clinical trials. If you think in the Alzheimer's space, a better understanding of whether someone is on a, a rapid a more rapid than is normal progressive pathway, no matter how early in the disease we're, we're trying to work. Um, and that's something that I think is, is, is now possible given these kinds of technologies. You may be, and Hussein, I think you're sure. joking that too. Yeah, <coughs> excuse me, I'd agree completely. So I think as you heard um, extensively this morning, it seems like it's a holy grail to get in early in the disease. And I do think these technologies are really gonna allow us you know, there's, um, we use the term disease interception where you really want to get in as early as you can in the illness, say, for example, Alzheimer's disease, when people are just for, 
first starting to manifest pathology in the brain. If you're doing studies there, you'll be able to demonstrate some, for example, hopefully some cognitive changes and hopefully ameliorate some of those. But then society, regulators, payers, etc., demand that you sort of relate those to long-term functional outcomes. And these technologies may really allow us to do that in a very ecologically valid way. So in the real world, be able to relate these cognitive changes to real world outcomes um, that matter. I think you heard earlier from Hugh Perry indirectly, how you know we've got to recognize that what the brain sort of does for a living is um, you know is the cognition, the emotion, the behavior, and we've been so far left to sort of subjective, relatively soft endpoints. These technologies allow you to make them much more objective, much more hard. As Jenny mentioned, you know, longitudinally measure them. That'll give us much more precision, reduce placebo responses, hopefully in increase signal to noise, which is going to be very important. And as I alluded to at the outset, these things are also going to be very important for psychiatric conditions where there's a recognized prodrome that unfortunately, you know, sort of once the illness is manifest, many patients have a downward course, assuming the prodrome. But what's, what's also equally important is most of the psychiatric illnesses, schizophrenia, depression, bipolar disorder, et cetera, are characterized by multiple recurrences and relapses. And those recurrences and relapses really produce much of the atrophic changes in the brain, the decline in <coughs> functional outcome, and the deterioration. And if you can use some of these technologies to monitor people so that we can change from a diagnose and treat to a predict and preempt paradigm, you could really make a difference in people's lives. And we have a number of pilots underway in Alzheimer's disease, in schizophrenia, in depression, and in autism to marry these technologies with the right biology and hopefully can make a real difference. It's truly fascinating. And Rich and Howard, you guys have been doing this in a really detailed and big way, I guess I would say, where you actually are in the clinics collecting this kind of very detailed data, which could easily be what these folks need to rely on and, and, and do their, because you know you might think, well, some of this is soft, but then when they unite it with your highly precise data, it becomes much harder. Rick, go ahead. Then, <coughs> yeah, I would, I would take a step back and think about where we've come in MS uh, and what the gaps are and what that tells us. Because I think if we learn from that, I think we could, as Howard said, we could make more progress in Alzheimer's disease as we get therapies. So in, in observing what's happened in MS, we've, we, we've now got over 10 therapies. <clears throat> we have uh, literally made enormous progress in, on the imaging side uh, with all sorts of new techniques. We have over 6,000 publications in peer-reviewed literature on biomarkers. But in the clinic, we have no standardization. Uh, we have no standard clinical metrics. We have very little other than the subjective interpretation of images. And we have no biomarkers. So I would urge us all, and digital health technology is going to go the same route. We're going to have lots of technology, but no standardization of that technology in the clinic. So I would, uh, not to be negative, I think we have an opportunity to fix that and change it. And I think what it's going to require is that we bring standardization to the medical practice and some coordination between the research enterprise and the healthcare enterprise. And I think, <clears throat> I think if we do that, we could bring digital technology and big data into healthcare and make much more rapid progress. I could talk more about that later, but I'll stop at this point and just say digital technology is just like imaging technology and biologic technology. There's tremendous progress, but it hasn't gotten into healthcare. And I think we need to think about that. So I would agree with Rick. Let me give you a vision for the future where I uh, see things heading and I'd like to see developed. So we're following our MS patients and we have all this data on them. If you have a chronic disease, and these neurologic diseases are chronic, okay, and things change. So what I envision and what we're trying to do is to develop biomarkers. Uh, one of the things we're not talking about today, but the microbiome is very important. So 
I tell my patients in the future, we're not only going to take a blood sample, we're going to take a stool sample. We may have to take a stool sample, take a wipe or something, et cetera. But what I would like to do is I would like to take the big data that we're generating, we're generating it now with Biogen and with Verily, which is part of Google, and I want to give it to the doctor. And with the cloud and with the ability to access data, I want the doctor to be using this data to make decisions, to then be putting that data into our big data, and so that it's a, uh, a living, growing, big data uh, source for our patients that every physician in the United States and in the world could then access. So you could see what's happening to MS patients everywhere in the world. So the nice thing they have here in, um, in London, et cetera, maybe certain patients aren't responding to one of the particular treatments. But that's, how, that's where I see big data going. I see bringing together all the physicians, all the patients, putting the data together, have doctors being able to access it, put in data, and have it change in real time. That's, that's where I think we're heading. Wait, John. I think that's exactly what you're doing, isn't it? Well, it, it is. I, I would sort of, we, we expand it slightly to look at populations and not just the clinical populations, or if you like, the general population. Uh, and the idea is uh, how to provide a more integrated approach to following people over time. So we need to do it at scale, and we are, I'm talking about hundreds of thousands. Um, we need to be able to do it with consent for trials so that a cohort is actually, at its very inception, a trials platform. Uh, that people are willing to be approached and they are willing to have, you know, to run, to take the risk of uh, risk disclosure when they upon the invitation. Uh, on that basis, you are able to standardize, uh, as uh, Rick suggested. Uh, you can look for particularly relevant uh, variables according to particular foci. Um, it's really not very difficult to do if we would just take a, a step back and organize slightly. And uh, uh, with the advent of uh, digital markers. Uh, it can be extremely cost effective, extremely. I would imagine something like uh, between uh, one and 10% of the, the cost of a conventional cohort. That's, you know, so we've all been fascinated by things like, um, you know, the new Google Home, for example, which, which can interpret our voice and the way that they can process faces on Facebook. And that's all being done by, by machine learning, which has really been using neural nets, which have a striking similarity, by the way, to the way our brain functions, and, and, they're, and they're falling apart, a striking similarity to how dementia can actually take place. But in your data enclave, you have a scenario where scientists who are experts in things like machine learning can actually go in, get their hands on data, and actually run these kinds of algorithms, putting together like Husseini and, and Jenny's parts, right, with Rick and Howard's, such that we could actually see how, learn in a similar way that we learn these algorithms um, uh, in, in, I'll call it conventional wear with you doctors, we can actually now learn this and provide the opportunity for some of our mathematical experts to get their hands on the data and see how they can actually do these predictions that we need to do, uh, maybe even 30 years ahead of time. Yep, so the model is very much bringing the, the research to the data. Um, I think that gives uh, confidence in terms of governance and security issues to uh, the data custodians. And we've built the infrastructure, we're, we're populating it, but it is definitely a matter of inviting scientists from wherever to come and play uh, within the secure environment. And it can be data mining, it can be hypothesis driven, it can be in silico experiments. Really, it, it's just, and if our view is that data is a public good, and that we need to you know, make it as available and accessible as possible. Now, Jenny, let's say we're incredibly successful and we can predict just based on your iPhone and your movement patterns that you're gonna have Alzheimer's in 20 years. How do we return those results to patients who might not, might not be that warm and fuzzy about getting them? Yeah, that's a really important question, and I, I don't know that I have the answer to that. I think that um, there's an education piece um, when you're talking about um, the outcome of machine learning models. You know, this is a long way from clinical practice right now. It's a long, long way from patients' understanding of disease and risk uh, and probability right now. Um, so part of what we all need to do is, is that 
piece about education. So as, as we have beautiful machine learning models in, in John's uh, data set and others that can help us to learn new things, we need to take that in, in two directions. We can use that to um, tell us something more that we didn't know before about the, the real biological nature of diseases. Maybe for Alzheimer's, we feel like we know what that is, but for mental health conditions, Hussaini was talking about depression, schizophrenia, bipolar, how we cut those apart is something that's um, uh, ve you know, very, very unclear. Um, it, uh, are those really three entities or, or, or are they uh, something different? Um, but these multi-domain data sets, multi-domain large data sets can start to teach us better um, about that basic biology. And then in the other direction, we need to start returning data that's useful to clinicians and, and to patients. And that requires um, not only getting the data science right, but then a level of interpretation that is useful. So our experience is that primary care doctors, for example, don't want to know someone's probability of um, uh, being in the early stages of Alzheimer's. They want to know red, amber, green. Do I do something with this patient? Do I uh, send them on a diagnostic pathway? Do I reassure them that they're fine? Do I ask them to come back in six months' time and, and test them again? So that kind of simplica simplification is necessary for um, non-specialist clinicians, and it's, it's certainly um, part of the pathway of getting to something that makes these data useful to patients. Hussaini, what do you yeah. see as the main problems here? Yeah, I, I would tend to agree completely and echo what um, Richard mentioned earlier. While there's tremendous promise here, we've got to do it right. And, you know, there's issues around privacy, there's issues around trust, there's, you know, um, who owns the data, who's is the data going to be made available to. As you all know, we're in the middle of, you know, concerns about hacking and <laughs> all those things. I think a couple of other concerns include, you know, sort of regulatory potential acceptance, because theoretically this isn't just about, you know, sort of, feeling slightly better on a Sunday morning. These are things that are going to hopefully help us make medically informed decisions. So we've got to do it right. And I think something that um, I think is also very important is that in my opinion, this isn't to take the place of medical, clinical judgment and care. And um, it's to aid that, to improve the quality of the decision making. You know, again, in, in almost every disease and disorder we deal with, you sort of ask patients to retrospectively think about what their signs and symptoms have been like over the last month, you know, that's, that's, vi that's notoriously inaccurate. With real-time data, not only can you get it objectively, but more precisely, and you can, you know, um, act on it in a more meaningful way, but you've got to make sure that you can help educate the um, clinical pop clinician population that this is going to be a tool that aids them rather than something that, need, that they should be threatened by because we want to make this as useful as possible. We use the term, you know, sort of a learning engine because we think like almost any, um, any biological study, you wouldn't jump in to, you know, a phase three clinical trial without first learning, validating an independent cohort, refining, and then getting out there. Right now, there seems to be almost a cottage industry of, you know, the app du jour that's being um, put out there with a lot of claims, and we've got to be very careful when we're talking about medical decision making to do it correctly. So we're really talking about some deep phenotyping now. Um, and um, Rick and Howard, you've been really on the forefront of, of, of collecting this in a very systematized manner. Are there any lessons that you've learned so far that you would say we should now apply to this deep phenotyping of dementia? Um, first of all, I think that we could apply technology to get data that physicians already understand and need at lower cost. And I think that would be a good move because um, digital technology has to provide value at the point of care. And, and, and so one way to achieve acceptance by physicians and patients is if the nature of the data is familiar and is going to be helpful um, given the current state. And I think that's a tremendous opportunity for advancing digital health technology right now. Um, there's, there's obviously a potential for digital health technology to completely redefine the clinical nature of disease. So biophysiometric signatures um, may completely redefine how we perceive of disease, diagnosing much earlier, 
uh, uh, determining patterns we didn't perceive. I think that's a bit off in the future, um, just, just like um, molecular redefinition of disease is a bit off in the future. I think the emphasis really needs to be on how to merge these new technologies, including digital health, with healthcare itself. Um, my own feeling about it is that if the, if the uh, financing system for healthcare were to reimburse based on outcomes or value, I don't think there would be a problem financing digital health technology. Mm -hmm. The problem is that it's an added cost right now and so most of the digital technology companies are trying to figure out how to finance their development. So I would make, uh, I would make two points. I think the first point I would make is I think that this big data that we do or any of the biomarkers or whatever have to be grounded in very hard biologic facts and so that we need to link what we're seeing, for example, in Alzheimer's or we're doing it now in MS, to very specific aspects of the disease. It may be uh, something in the blood, it may be something in the urine, it may be something on MRI, but it needs to be linked to a very hard biologic outcome. And then that needs to be validated. Uh, so we link it to a hard biological outcome, we validate it, that's what we're doing, and then we can apply it broadly. broadly. So I think if you talk about Alzheimer's or dementia, we're working the same thing. What's the hard biology it's linked to? Uh, how do you validate it, and how do you look at it broadly? The second thing I would say, and I think this is true for all the neurologic diseases, is time. This, ha this isn't appendicitis. This is something that goes over time. If I treat an MS patient, and I can treat them for two years, but eight years later they're not doing well, then I haven't really succeeded. So I think all this big data and all the things we're doing have to uh, be evaluated over time and have to be validated over time. Now that may not be something we like to hear, but it becomes very, very important because one or two years isn't enough if you're talking about MS or talking about Alzheimer's disease. That's great. I'm having a terrible time because great questions are coming <coughs> through in this and I'm, I, they flick by, so I have to kind of, all right, so one of them was for John and Jenny. With all this big data and, and, and personal data that we're, that we're able to gather, have any been clearly I don't think it said clearly. Have any been changed any lifestyle choices, or can you imagine how they would influence lifestyle choices for, for folks? Yeah, I think that's really in the category of low-hanging fruit that, that Rick was uh, <coughs> describing here. So digital biomarkers might be, uh, you know, might take a long time to come to meaningful, meaningfully change patients' lives, but there might be things that we can do in the short term uh, that um, help patients to uh, deal with their disease better. So it might be easier to help patients adhere to their treatment better or uh, support lifestyle changes. And that might be easier than developing new drugs, new, new, new uh, treatment pathways. We have recently started a program of work with Takeda, for example, um, which is about helping patients with depression, um, supporting them to uh, adhere to their treatment, essentially, by helping them to understand um, whether, it's, uh, whether it's improving their symptoms or not. So some, I think some very sim simple things that are very amenable to... Um, uh, consumer devices, smartphones and the like um, might be uh, a way into this problem of how we get the value of digital um, health recognised in the healthcare field. So what affects the body affects the brain yep. uh, and the, the, uh, the evidence on uh, lifestyle uh, reducing certainly <coughs> vascular risk and a vascular risk not being uh, insulated from amnesic risk um, or amnestic risk uh, is... Um, is uh, uh, very, very useful. I certainly take a little bit more exercise than I used to, and contrary to observation, I eat less fat. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I think the best, the best treatment is called Glenfiddich. <laughs> One, once a week. If I could just add, so I, I think, you know, I'd agree completely with the comments you just heard. And I think if we're able to get to, you know, perhaps using some of these digital technologies to come up with a, a number for, you know, one of some of these domains, then you can basically track it like we do cholesterol, <coughs> blood pressure, et cetera, and at least get some feedback that the lifestyle changes you're adopting are at the very least preserving that cognitive health, if not even improving it because I think that's one of the challenges we have in this space is you don't have necessarily the feedback loop 
that anything you're doing or not doing is having the desired impact. And if we can start to quantify these things in a little bit more facile manner, I think that would be the benefit as well. Absolutely. So, Howard, if I, sorry, Sean, if I could just, just <coughs> yeah. the, 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 the public health uh, uh, fact of the matter is that uh, what makes a big difference at a population risk level actually makes a very small difference at an individual level. So in one sense, that, uh, although I think feedback I is really critically motivationally, uh, and when you're on the downward curve, it's, it's e easily detectable. Uh, when you're just at those very early preclinical stages, it's exceptionally uh, difficult to detect. But nevertheless, to, to move from we, we have a brain problem to actually we want to promote a brain health and have that cultural change where people's part of everyday, people's everyday psyche is wanting to uh, maintain their cognitive health, uh, wanting to adopt a lifestyle which promotes their cognitive health, and being able to monitor it um, uh, without prejudice or without stigma, I, I think would be a, a fantastic way forward. I agree, and I think that's one place where there is, um, where even though patients don't understand the complexities of data in the way that we think about them, um, the message that, for example, one's brain health is as manageable as one's cardiac health mm. is something that, you know, there's a huge opportunity that that's something that pa patients don't understand at all. They don't realise that you can prevent dementia to about the same extent as you can prevent, prevent a heart attack. Absolutely. And another question came through as far as, so knowledge is power to the patient, but what about access to their medical record? I mean, so Rick and, and Howard are collecting massive amounts of data, but do patients have access to that, to that data and could they, in a similar way, have make decisions based on that? Well, they, you know, if we, we can give them access to all the data, but they can, you know, there's a million points of all the different things. But we have, um, we've collated everything into a um, uh, one sheet that shows their disability, shows their medicine, shows their MRI, shows the things, and they could look at their disease over five or 10 or 15 years, and we hand it to them. And they really enjoy looking at that. It makes a big difference. So I think that we do need to give the patients some pictorial representation. It needs to be over time, and they need to understand it. Sometimes it's frightening to them because they don't like to see which way things are going. Many times in many of our patients uh, where they're doing well, they say, oh, my God, I've been seeing you, Dr. Weiner, for uh, 15 years, and look, this is all flat. Uh, and... Uh, <laughs> That's very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> and he's saying, so one of the questions is, what can we do? So we we're talking about these great technology, but it hasn't been so much adopted by physicians. So what can we do to improve the rate of technology adoption by the, by the physician? Um, you know, I, I do think, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I do think it's one of those things that you want to get physicians to adopt them. You want individuals to adopt them, but I do think you want to be careful, like in anything, not to overpromise. So I think we're at a stage where we want to collect the data. You know, sort of we're living in this world where almost everyone has a mobile phone. We've got you know connectivity and a lot of those things. So the ability to um, both passively collect information, or in some ways to relatively easily you know sort of um, enter information, I think that that is um, clearly there and is relatively low in terms of the burdensomeness. So I do think we, it behooves us to sort of make sure that we're capturing this information. As I mentioned, and I may be repeating myself, I am concerned that we don't um, do too much too soon in terms of trying to suggest we know exactly what this means before we do, because you can have you know, blips in data that may or may not portend something you know, serious, et cetera. And we want to make sure that if this data is being collected um, by the medical professions, I think, I think you know, for this kind of data, it's actually going to be patients who own them and make them available to others. So we want to be careful not to be suggesting that if you see this thing, it definitively means this for you. But I think the more we can edu educate people to collect the data, we can make meaningful um, advances in terms of understanding and ultimately get to a point where we can really make recommendations based on it. Great, so thank you. So 20 seconds each, going from Howard to Zaney. What's the main message you think we should? Well, I think we should take the big data, we should put it all together, and somehow or other give the patient a number. And so that they see what the number is, they see where they are, they feel good, they feel bad, 
That's a communication. I sometimes give my patients A pluses. They love that. And then they say, well, last time you gave me an A plus, this time only an A. Why is that? Uh, so I think that's what I would do. I think we need to change the big data into numbers that patients can understand. Okay, I, I would take a step back. I think our biggest resource is the population at large. Uh, and I would find ways of engaging and inviting, uh, and I've seen this completely seriously, the entire population uh, to engage in uh, uh, population-based dementia research through yeah. digital markers. Jen. I think we have to persist. Um, I think, yes, there will be regulatory challenges, there will be reimbursement challenges, but I think digital biomarkers can help um, uh, risk management, um, the ability to detect early and our ability to detect an effective drug earlier in clinical trials. So yeah. it's worth persisting. I think the big picture is we're on the precipice of uh, personalized neurotherapeutics where we can manage these chronic devastating diseases. The opportunities, which are also challenges, are an explosion of technology, digital, informatics, imaging, and biology. And I think we need a strategy to bring those technologies into healthcare uh, so that we can reap the benefits of the new treatments. Yeah, I'd largely agree with that. I think, I think as um, my colleagues have mentioned, you know, you want to marry the biology with the technology. As Jenny mentioned, you know, there's a number of challenges, but not only are they, are they surmountable, they're very worth surmounting, because I think this is one of those few areas where brain diseases and disorders are actually going to benefit disproportionately compared to other conditions, because these are readouts for the brain. And I think if most of us can probably not even remember the last time we set foot in a bank physically, do it all online and you know all these issues were navigated by the banking industry I don't see why we can't do it here to help humanity thank you very much thank you very much thank you.